Welcome to another episode of Chasing Fire on my Mining America channel. And you know what? I mean, I shouldn't even say on my Mining America channel because if I had my preference, it would be all over the freaking place. Um, today we're talking about Grandpa George again. Sorry for those that wanted a live stream on Sunday yesterday. I just could not do it and get done what I got done. But I'm telling you right now, man, my day yesterday, I busted my ass non-stop. I mean, it's funny though, like about five hours of that busting my ass is on my ass and literally sitting on my butt. But, oops, that's not my hand. I did fantastic. I think the mic is working. Oh, that's not good. Now I'm not sure if my mic is working. Hmm, this is weird. How's the sound there to the one person that just popped in? Because uh, my mic is not reacting the way it typically does. I'm in my settings right now. No, it does not say it's picking it up. Okay. Can you hear me? Oh man, I hit the start live button too fast. That's what's going on right now. This should be working, but I can't tell. So the next thing to do is go and check YouTube. Here's my it's live now. Hi, three people. It does not sound like there's anything coming through though. No, there's check, 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 check. Okay. Okay, so we got a baseline. I know you guys can hear me for the second. I'm just working on the sound real quick. I apparently hit the live button too fast. I thought everything was good to go, and then it, it's just turned into. I'm not, it's not good to go. <laughs> the mics aren't working yet. And this mic does not work as good as this mic, although it doesn't sound as bad as it should for the amount of wind I have moving in the room. Uh, I still would like to get this mic on for if I can. So uh, I'm going to attempt that really quickly. Although, you know what? I did hang the cord up on something and it did get yanked out of my pocket. So there is the possibility that it's not reacting. Properly. No, the receiver says it's definitely reacting properly. Go for another plug in. Check, check. Check, check, check. Check, check, check. Man, it must. Okay, we're good. All right, how's that sound? That should be better, I think. Yay, we're back. The sound is good. The world is fantastic. Good morning, my dear Margaret. How are you doing? It wasn't sounding too bad after I got it working. Uh, it was not sounding at all in the beginning. <laughs> hey, five people. We got a nice little crowd starting off already this morning. So I did not live stream yesterday and I was making my apologies for not live streaming when I realized that my mic was not working. Oh, you know, I don't have one second. I need to grab a, a cushion. I'm realizing that my backside is too short and that's why sitting in chairs for periods of time hurt my back really bad. That my lazy ass needs to go and start working out again and doing some push uh, pull ups and stuff like that for my back because I'm definitely feeling 
the difference of not being a hard body anymore. Now that I am a soft body right now, my body has all kinds of stupid little aches and pains it didn't have when I was always sore from trying to be a hard body. So I'm going to go back trying to be a hard body because uh, generally every moment feels better. Um, now, what was I talking about before I realized the mic wasn't working? Sunday. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. So... The weekends right now and at least two weekdays have to be spent at the dog track poker room. Um, I'm just playing too good, and when the cards are falling good for me and I'm not getting unlucky, I'm playing really, really good. Uh, I didn't make one wrong decision yesterday. I didn't get caught in a situation where I didn't know what was going on. I didn't lose a big hand or a big all-in to anybody not knowing what the gambling was going to be going on before it happened. Um, my gut instinct was so on that I was generally playing super tight and the table was starting to notice this. And there was a $6 uh, straddle on the button when the cards came out. And so like five people called that before it got to me. So I decided, I looked down at a 9-6 of hearts. I, I know it's about Grandpa George today, but I'll get there. I looked down at 9-6 of hearts, and I'm thinking about how my table image is. And I, at this point, it's later in the evening, and I have about $1,000 in front of me, and everybody else has about three to maybe two to 300 in, two to 400 in front of them, most of them being below 200. Uh, I'm like definitely the, the chip leader at the table. And so I decide there's already almost $30 in the pot, so I'm going to raise it to 55 So I put 55 out there. Now here's the funny thing. Out of those five people that had already called $6 before it got to me, four of these motherfuckers called knowing I'm tight. <laughs> and the flop came. So there's, all, there's already $260, $240 inside the pot or $30 inside the pot when the flop comes out. And the flop comes nine heart heart. And I'm like, oh, man, well, I got top pair. Most of these people that called me probably either called me with either a small pair or over card. So I'm probably sitting on the best hand right now. The best thing to do in this position is since I let out betting and I'm first position, I'm first to act at this point, which would have been last to act on the last round. Um, I decide that I have to represent as if I have a big over pair. There's too much money in the pot. So I bet out with $100. And it goes to the next guy, and he calls. <laughs> and it goes around, good morning, Archangel for Truth. And it goes around, and everybody else folds. And it comes back to me, and I'm hoping on the flush card. And a, I think it was a jack comes out. Or no, it was, it was low. It was like a six comes out, which makes me for a part. It wasn't a six, I'm sorry, because I had nine six. It was some other blank that made me for a possible straight draw. So I got more out. But the table was talking really weird, and he was acting like he had a big over pair. He was totally acting like he had a big over pair. So I tried table talking him, and I said, hey, uh, do you want me to put you all in? Because he only had like 125 bucks left at this point, and there's like $400 in the pot. Statistically, he should have already shoved on me, or, or if I give him the opportunity, he, he's supposed to shove on me. And the dealer tells me we can't table talk to each other, even though we're the only two people in the hand. There's four hundred dollars in the pot, which is a really dumb decision. Not not accurate at all. Shouldn't be accurate at all. So the guy's like, uh, I can't say. And so he sits there. And I said, I, I tell you what, I'll let you make the decision, because you're supposed to shove right here. And I said, check. And so he goes, check. And the next card comes out as a six. So I did not make my flush, but I made two pair. My two pair also makes it possible straight. But my two pair makes me extremely strong if he's holding an over pair, which I'm convinced he has an over pair at this point. For the way he's acting, he would have shoved on me if he had a set. There was too many draws. So I was like, sorry, man, I got to go all in on this card. And he goes in the tank, hymns and haws about it for like three or four minutes and finally makes the call. Last 125 bucks. So, I mean, from that one person, I pulled like $400. When I went in, I bought in for $200. When I left last night, I had a profit of $900. Um, that's not even a really great night. 
uh, there was a gentleman there that sat there for about 18 hours and he was running really good and he was playing really good and he was up $4,000 on a $150 buy-in. I don't know of another lucrative, or I don't know of another legal way to make money like this, except maybe start doing OnlyFans. Hey, do you guys want to pay for my OnlyFans? Anyways, now we'll get to Grandpa George, because that's an exciting moment of what happened with me last night. Um, I paid the rent. I got some stuff out of Hawk that I put in Hawk to try and pay the rent. And uh, I've got a whole bunch of gold for a family member I need to sell, but I don't want to sell it to the to the pawn shops. Pawn shops want to give you so little on something. They'll, they'll try and give you like $250 on something you know retails for five grand. Because we all got a computer in our phone now, in our pocket now. And we can all just look it up. <laughs> like Down to three people. Those two must not like poker stories. So uh, today we're going back to talking to, talking about Grandpa George. We are going to get to that right now. I didn't share my screen earlier, so uh, I'm going to share that now. Do to do. Do 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 do. What do you mean it's not there? Uh, if I can get two more days, just two more days that were like this day next week, I'm going to finish building the supercomputer I have sitting in my living room, and then the streaming will go to another level again, and it'll be a really good level because I, I want to be able to put on some stuff that I'm not willing to sell inexpensively, and I want to move at more of a fair price, and I think some auctions that could just keep running live while I'm not streaming would be a good idea and uh, getting a, a, a ring central phone number so that people could call to verify so that all of the bids would be verified. That way I wouldn't have to necessarily deal with, you know, people that are fake pumping and stuff like that, or people that don't have any interest in buying something, bidding on stuff since, although I guess if I do that too, I should probably just spend the money on buying a webmaster and start setting up a goddamn website because I should have done that years ago. It would have been paying for itself plus by now. Dumbest mistake, not spending the money on a webmaster. But everybody wanted like a recurring fee. They were like, hey, I can host your, your channel for you. Yeah, $300 a month. I'm like, my channel doesn't make $300 a month. I can't guarantee I can pay somebody $300 a month when I'm barely surviving. My channel doesn't pay for itself. <laughs> All righty, one second. I'm going to turn my AC on. It was blowing way too cold earlier this morning, and uh, now it's not blowing at all. We're just about there with this really long intro. But one of the good things about a really long intro like this is at least it's not like other live streams on Twitch where you're looking at a counting screen for five minutes if you're actually sitting here live. I hate those things if it's at all possible to not do them, yet I do understand now with the fiascos that happen with live streaming, especially if you unplug and replug in equipment, uh, th those, those countdowns are not necessarily because they want them there. So here we go. On the high priest's breastplate. I wonder what happens if we just Google search that. Huh, okay. It brings up that there is a lot of people that have made some sort of an imitation representation. Very early and very naturally, the religious nature of man led to the use of precious stones in consecration with worship. The most valuable and elegant objects being shown for sacred purposes. Of this model of thought, we have a striking instance in the accounts given in the book of Exodus of the breastplate of the high priest 
and the, and the gems contributed for the tabernacle by the Israel by the Israelis in the wilderness. Another religious association of such objects is their use of symb, symbol is their use to symbolize ideas of the divine glory, and illustrate in the visions of the prophet Ezekiel and in the description of New Jerusalem in the book of Revelation. Apart from such legitimate uses, however, gems have become associated with all manner of religious fancies and superstitions, traces of which appear in the Talmud, the Quran, and similar writings. They have also been dedicated to various heathen deities. Even in modern times, some trace of the same ideas remain in a class. Oh, I, I, I started it right. Remain in a class. A class Ecclesiastical, <laughs> e. I know this fucking word, and and I started to say it right, and then my brain paused on it, and now I can't say it right. <laughs> Ecclesiastical jewelry and is supposed to sim and its supposed symbolism. <coughs> In the vision of Ezekiel, I twenty six. And in a brief allusion to the similar appearance of God of Israel in Exodus 2014, the throne of Jehovah, or the pavement beneath his feet, is compared to a sapphire. And the Apostle John in the Apocalypse describes the great white throne as surrounded by a rainbow like an emerald. The rabbinical writings, instead of the simple grandeur of these biblical comparisons, Give us fanciful ideas. The stones of the breastplate are here represented as sacred to 12 mighty angels who guard the gates of paradise. And wondrous tales are told of the luminous gems in the tent of Abraham and the Ark of Noah. Mohaddin legend, Mohaddinian legends represent the different heaven, heavens as composed of different precious stones. And in the Middle Ages, those religious ideas became interwoven with a host of astrological, astrological, alchemistic, and medical superstitions. The following is a description of the breastplate given in Exodus 15 through 13. And thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. After the work of, of Ephod, thou shalt make it of gold, of blue, and of purple, and of scarlet, and of fine twinned linen, shalt thou make it. Four square it shall be doubled. A span shall be the length thereof, and a span shall be the breadth thereof. And thou shalt set in the setting of stone even four rows of stones. The first row shall be a sardius, a topaz, and a carbuncle. This shall be the first row. And the second row shall be an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. And the third row, a ligure, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a barrel, and an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold in their enclosings. And the stone shall be with the names of the children of Israel, twelve according to their names. Like the engraving of a signet, every one with his name shall be according to the twelve tribes. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate chains at the ends of wreathen work of pure gold. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate two rings of gold, and shalt put two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. And thou shalt put two wreathen chains of gold in the two rings on which are on the ends of the breastplate. And the other two ends of the wreathen chains thou shalt fasten in the two ounces and put them on the shoulder pieces of ephod before it, of the ephod before it. And thou shalt make two rings of gold, and thou shalt put them upon two ends of the breastplate in the border thereof, which is in the side of the ephod inward. And other rings, and two other rings of gold thou shalt make, and shalt put them on the sides of, if, of the ephod underneath, towards the forepart four part thereof, and against the other coupling thereof above the curious girdle of the ephod. And they shall bind the breastplate by the rings thereof onto the rings of the ephod with the lace of the blue, 
that it may be above the curious girdle of the ephod, and the breastplate not be loosened from the ephod. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart, when he goeth on to the holy place, for the memorial before the Lord continually. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urium and the Thummim, and they shall be upon the Aaron's heart, when he goeth in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. Of the miraculous quality of the stones worn by the high priest, the Jewish historian Josephus, 37 through 95 AD, says, but the air conditioning didn't turn on. From the stones of which the high priest wore, these were the sacred onyxes, and I hold it superfluous to describe their nature. Since it is known to all, there emanates a light as often as God was represent at the sacrifice. On that which was worn on his right shoulder, instead of a clasp emanating a resonance sufficient, a radiance sufficient to give light even to those far away. Although the stone previously lacked this splendor, and certainly this is itself merits the wonder of all those who do not, out of contempt of re for religion, allow themselves to be allowed away by a pretense of wisdom. However, I am about to relate something still more wonderfully, namely that God announced victory in battle by means of the twelve stones worn by the high priest on his breast. Set in the pictorial, for such a splendor stone, from them when the army was not yet in motion, that all the people knew that God himself was present to aid them. For this reason... The Greeks who revere our Solomites, since they could not deny this, called the pictorial or oracle. However, the pictorial and the onyxes ceased to emanate this radiance 200 years before the time when I write this, because God was displeased at the transgressions of the law. And the law doth transgresseth. The only one nowadays who don't think the law transgresses is the cops. Because they think they are the law. They're not. This writer, who must have seen the high priest wearing his elaborate vestments, says that the breastplate was adorned with 12 stones of exceptional size and beauty, a decoration not easily to be acquired, an account of its enormous size. However, these gems were not merely rare and costly, but they also possessed wonderful and miraculous powers. Writing about 400 AD, St. Ephanius, Bishop of Constantina, tells of a marvelous Adamus, which was worn on the breastplate of the high priest, which showed himself to, who showed himself to people arrayed in all of his gorgeous vestments. At the Feast of Pasha, Pentecost, and tabernacles, this Adamus was termed the was termed the tabernacle. This oh, I got the declaration. This Adamus was termed termed the declaration because by its appearance, it announced to people the fate of the the fate that God had in store for them. If the people were sinful and disobedient, the stone assumed a dusky hue, which pretended death by disease, or else it became the color of blood signifying that the stone shone like the driven snow I, by it became the color of blood, signifying that the people would be slain by the sword. However, if, however, the stone shone like the driven snow, then the people recognized that they had not sinned and hastened to celebrate the festival. Sorry, I had to backtrack. I, I, I skipped a line. There seemed to be little doubt that this account is nothing more than an elaborate than an elaboration and modification of the passage of Josephus. Evidently, the oracle of Josephus has become the declaration. When Moses wished to engrave on the stones of the breastplate the names of the twelve tribes of Israel, he is said to have had recourse to the miraculous Shamir. The names were first traced in ink on the stone, and the Shamir was then passed over, to, over them. The result being that the traced inscription became graven on the stones. In proof of the magical character of this operation, 
No particles of the gem were removed in the process. The name really designates emery. An argument against the use of especially rare and costly stones in decoration of the breastplate has been found in its probable size. We are told that when folded, it measured a span in each direction, and this would indicate that its length and breadth were each from eight to nine inches. In this case, the stones themselves would have to be measured, might have measured two by two and a half inches. And in view of the number of characters required to express some of the tribal names, these dimensions do not seem excessive. It is highly improbable that in the time of Moses, precious stones like the ruby, the emerald, or the sapphire would have been made available in, the dim in these dimensions. The difficulty of engraving very hard stones with the appliances at the command of the Hebrews of this period must also be taken into consideration. As we shall see, however, there is good reason to believe that after the Babylonian captivity, a new breastplate was made. And at the time, it may have been easier to secure the work of precious stones of great value and at a high degree of hardness. We must also bear in mind that in those periods, perfection was not so great a requisite as rich color. In his commentary on Exodus 28, Cornelius Lepade, Cornelius van den Steen, discusses the question of the diamond in the high priest's breastplate. In the first place, he notes that the diamond was very costly and that the large stone would have been needed to bear the name of Judea or that of any other tribe. He considers Judah. He considers that a stone of the requisite size would have cost a hundred thousand gold crowns, and he ha asks, "When hence could the poor Hebrews have obtained such a sum of money, and where could they have found such a diamond?" He proceeds to give still another reason for doubting that the diamond was in the breastplate, namely that it would have been marked too great a distinction between the tribes. The result being that the tribe to which the diamond was assigned would have, been, would, would have been puffed up with pride, while the others would have been filled with hatred and envy, for the diamond is the queen of all the gems. The use of the breastplate to reveal the guilt of, the, of an offender is testified to in a Sumerian version of the book of jo Joshua, which has been discovered by Dr. Moses, Moses Gastier, chief rabbi of the Spanish of Portuguese Jews in England. According to this version, a Chan steals a golden image from a heathen temple in Jericho. The high priest's breastplate reveals his guilt, for the stones lose their light and grow dim when his name is pronounced. Many conjectures have been made as to the origin of the breastplate with the mystic ermin and thermin enclosed within it. That an Egyptian origin should be sought seems most probable. A breastplate ornament worn by the high priest of Memphis as figured in the Egyptian relief consists of 12 small balls or crosses intended to represent Egyptian hieroglyphs. As it cannot be determined that these figures were cut from precious stones, the only definite connection with the Hebrew ornamentation is the number of the figures. This suggests, but fails to prove a common origin. The monuments show that the high priest of Memphis wore this ornament as early as the 4th dynasty or approximately 4000 BC. Of the Ermin and Thurman, the mysterious oracle of the ancient Hebrew St. Augustine 354 through 450 AD, after the acknowledging the great difficulty of interpreting the meaning of the words and the characters of the oracle, adds that some believe the words to signify a single stone which changed color according as the answer color according as the answer was favorable or unfavorable oh the color of the stone changes color if the favorable if the answer was favorable or unfavorable while the priest was entering the sac sanctuary he still thought it possessed it possible that merely the letters of the words ermin and thurman were inscribed upon the breastplate after the capture of jerusalem by titus in 70 a.d the treasures of the temple were carried off to Rome, and we learn from Josephus that the breastplate was deposited in the Temple of Concord, which has been erected by Vespasian. Here it is believed to have been at the time of the sacking of Rome by the Vandals under the Gen Genesaric in 455. Although Reverend C.W. King thinks this is not improbable, that 
Alaric, king of the Visigoths, when he sacked Rome in 410 AD, might have secured this treasure. However, the express statement from Procopi Procopius that the vessel of the Jews were carried through the streets of Constantinople on the occasion of the Vandalic triumph of Belisarius in 534 may be taken as a confirmation of the conjecture that the Vandals had secured possession of the breastplate and its jewels. It must, however, be carefully noted that Proco Procopius nowhere mentions that the breastplate <clears throat> nowhere mentions the breastplate and that it need not have been included among the vessels of the Jews. It appears that this part of the spoils of <laughs> Belisarius was Church of Saint Sophia, and sometimes later the emperor is said to have heard is said to have heard of saying that a certain Jew to the effect that until the treasure of the temp <clears throat> until the treasures of the temple were restored to Jerusalem they would bring misfortune upon any place where they might be kept. If this story be true, Justinian may have felt that the fate of Rome was a lesson for him and that Constantinople must be saved from the like disaster. Moved by such consideration, he is said to have set the sacred vessel to Jerusalem and that they were placed in the church of the Holy Sepulchre. I was about to pronounce that completely wrong. This brings us to the last two events, which can be even plausibly connected with the mystic 12 gems, namely the captor, capture and sack of Jerusalem by the Sassanian Sassan, Sassanian Persian king, Kusura II in 1615, and the overthrow of the Sassanian Empire by the Mohad. Mohammedan Arabs. I always want to pronounce that the way it is in Dune. I always want to say Mohadin, but that's not the way it's it's it's, it's Mohammedan. Mohammed it's Mohammedan. Oh my God, I've heard that word a thousand times. Mohammedan by the Mohammedan Arabs. Arabs is probably not a nice thing to say now, is it? I don't. I, I don't know. It's not nice. Mohammedan Arabs and the capture and sack of, and then they give me a fucking worst one. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Sorry, kitties. Stesiphion and the sack of Stesiphion in 637. I need to stop commenting and just read the damn thing. If we admit that Kusaran, Kusara took the sacred relics of the temple with him to Persia, we may be reasonably sure that they were included among the spoils secured by the Arab conquerors. Although king, he was in genuine, ingen, ingenuously endeavored to trace out the history of the breastplate. Ingenuously. Ingenuously? Yeah, it's ingenuously. So he was, like, not really. Who had ingenuously endeavored to trace out the history of the breastplate. Jewels from the fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., believes that there may still be buried in some unknown treasure chamber of one of the old Persian capitals. That it may still be. A fact which has generally been overlooked by those who are... <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'm sweating my butt off. I can't keep a happy medium here. I'm always either too hot or too cold. It's my menopause. I am 45 now. A fact which has generally been overlooked by those who have embarked on the sea of conjecture relative to the fate of the breastplate stone is that a large Jewish contingent numbering some 26,000 men formed part of the force which with the Susanian Persians captured Jerusalem and they might well lay claim to any Jewish vessels or jewels that may have been secured by the conquerors. In this case, however, it is still probable that these precious objects fell into the hands of the Mohadinians who captured Jerusalem in the same year in which they took Stesiphon. One circumstance 
which may have contributed to the preservation of these gems in their original form after they fell into the hands of the Romans, is the fact that each one was engraved with the name of one of the Jewish tribes. The inscription being probable in the older form of Hebrew writing, which was used in the coinage even as late as the last revolt of 137 AD. Hence, recutting would have been necessary to fit them for use as ornaments, a process not easily accomplished and involving a great loss of size. We must also bear in mind that the intrinsic value of the gems may not have been so great as many suppose, since all of them were probable of the less perfect forms of the precious and semi-precious varieties. It is very likely that the enthusiastic statements of Josephus in this connection were dictated by national pride or arose from the tendency to, exagger to exaggeration so common among the Oriental writers. Certainly, if the breastplate known to Josephus was made not long after the return of the Jews from Babylon, ca from Babylonian captivity, their financial resources at the time of the, its fabrication were quite restricted. Admitting as a possibility that the Arabs may have secured possession of the breastplate, how would they have regarded it? The heroes of the Old Testament, and especially Moses, were such sacred personalities in the eyes of the Mohadinians that this relic would have been as precious to them as it is for us. However, the victorious Arabs who, am who overran the Sasanian Empire, although filled with religious zeal, were no students of archaeology and would have been quite unable to decipher the strange characters engraved on the stone. They would most probably have supposed them to be Persian characters and would therefore have valued th these stones no higher than others in the Persian treasure. This can serve as the explanation for the fact that no allusions to the breastplate with its adornments can be found in the works of these, those Mohadinian writers, such as Tabari, who, who treat of the overthrow of the Sasanian Empire. We must be sure that the Persians themselves would have accord with would have accorded no special honor to objects connected with the Hebrew religion, since their own Zoroastrian, Zora, Zoroastrian faith had no connection with it. <clears throat> I need to reset. Like, I'm not reading with proper inflection right now. It's coming out too robotic and gravelly. I'm pretty sure if I was recording this and editing it later, I'd have to reshoot that whole section because I would hate the way it came off. In 628, not long before the date of the Arab invasion, the most precious relic of Christendom the cross discovered by Helena, mother of Constantine the Great, and believed to be the very cross on which Christ died, was surrendered to the Greek emperor Heraclius by Kobad II, son of Kurushu II, on the conclusion of a treaty of peace between the Eastern and Sasanian empires. This cross was one of the sacred objects borne away to Persia from Jerusalem by Kusaran in, 16, in 615 AD. It is said to have been guarded carefully through the influence of Syrah, Kusaran's Christian wife. There is a bare possibility that other objects of religious veneration taken from Jerusalem may have been given up by the Persians at the same time, and that the unique character of the most important relics so overshadowed all others that historians have failed to note that fact. The other cross was restored to Jerusalem by Heraclius in 629, only to fall into the hands of the Mohadinians when the city was taken by Arabs under Omar in 637. Hence, if the jeweled breastplate had been surrendered to Kobad, it would probably have shared the same fate. We have here a wide field of conjecture, but unfortunately nothing more. Still, in the absence of any definite and trustworthy information, there is a kind of romantic interest in viewing the various possible relations of the mystery surrounding the fate of the most precious gems, historically at least, that have ever 
existed. More especially, is this interest justified in the case of all who were disposed to prize gems and jewels for their symbolic significance? For as we have shown this significance as far as concerning natal stones and the spiritual interpretation of the qualities of the heart and soul symbolized by the color and character of the principal precious and semi-precious stones has its root in the veneration felt by early Christian writers. Beginning with the author of the Apocalypse for the unforgettable for the unforgotten and unforgettable gems that were worn by the Hebrew high priest. A rather ingenious utilization of the reputed powers of Aaron's breastplate comes to us in a book printed in, printed in Portland, Maine. The writer assumes that the Urim, that the, that the Urim and the Thummim enclosed in the folds of the breastplate consist of the 12 stones duplicated of those engraved with the names of the tribes. And so disposed that, when they were shaken to and fro and then allowed to come to rest, three of them would become visible through the aperture in the ephod, just below the rows of set stones. The significance of the oracle is given by the various combinations of colors, of color, offered by the three stones that reveal themselves. To each combination, a prearranged meaning is given. That anything of the kind could have been true of the original Urim and Thurman is scarcely worthy the trouble I didn't need to do that is scarcely worthy the trouble of reputation but the practical results of the modern experiment is a clever oracle which will probably enjoy a certain vogue for those who with the late laminated lieutenant, lieutenant Cotton see in the tribes Manasseh and Ephraim the Anglo-Saxon of England and the United States and who look upon George the Fourth as the king? Oh, I'm sorry, George the Fifth as the king who sits upon the throne of David. These symbolical stones of the breastplate acquired an added significance. While not pretending to be able to follow all the intricate and certainly most ingenious and interesting speculations of this school of biblical ex, ex genius, we cannot help express some astonishment that Ephraim should be thought to prefigure England and Masia, the United States instead of vice versa. I, I didn't understand that sentence, and, and it, it's so stumbly, I don't even want to reread it, but I'm going to. While not pretending to be able to follow all the intricacies, intricacies, intricate and certainly most ingenious and interesting speculations of this school of biblical ex-genus, we cannot help expressing some astonishment that Ephraim should be thought to prefigure England and Manasseh, the United States, instead of vice versa. In Genesis XLVIII 17 through 20, the text more especially referred to it to in these speculations, Jacob's blessing is bestowed upon Ephraim in spite of Joseph's protest that it should go to the eldest son Man Manasseh. To this protest, Jacob answers, I know it, my son, I know it. He also, Manasseh, shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seeds shall become a multitude of nations. Certainly, the very compo certainly, the very composite, I'm stumbling over really easy words. Certainly, the very composite population of the United States perfectly merits this description. As a general rule, however, the Hebrews, who when using the names Ephraim and Manasseh, I, I'm butchering that one, as tribal designations, maintained the twelve-fold division of the people by substituting these tribes for Joseph and by dropping the name of Levi from the list. The tribe of Levi has been assigned as priests to the care of the sanctuary and not participating in the division of the land of promise. In Midrash, Bemibar, Benadar, the rabbinical commentary on numbers, the tribes are given in their order. With the stone appropriate to each and the color of the tribal standard pitched in the desert camp. Oh, I thought they were right here. Why did the... Where was I at? Pitched in the rebel camp. Oh, 
Oh, I totally lost my place by changing my my glasses. All right, I guess I'm expressing pretty ignorant moves, Saya. We cannot help expressing some astonishment that Ephraim should be thought to prefigure England and Saya, the United States. Oh, I definitely went through this. Certainly, the very composite population of the United States perfectly merits this description. As a general rule, the Hebrews, when using the names Ephraim and Manasseh as tribal designations, maintained the twelve-fold division of the people by substituting these tribes for Joseph and by dropping the names of Levi from the list. The tribe of Levi being assigned as priest to the care of the sanctuary and not participating in the division of the land of promise. In the Midrash Bemidar, the rabbinical commentary on numbers, the tribes have been given in their order. With the stone appropriate to each and the color of the tribal standard pitched in the desert camp, this color corresponding in each case with that of the tribal stone. This list represents a tradition dating back to at least the 12th century and possibly much earlier than that. Hence, its value should not be underestimated, although we may not accept it without some reserves. And there's this list of tribes. Odom, Reuben, Red, Pidah, Simon, Green, Bearketh, Levi, White, Black, and Red, Josephek, Judah, Sky Blue, Saphir, Issachar, Black, like Didium, Yalom, Zebulon, White, Leshem, Dan, Sapphire Color, Huh, that's a lot of colors. Shebo, Gad, gray. Alamash, Naphtali, wine color. Tarshish, Asher, pearl color. Shoham, Joseph, very black. Yashifeh, Benjamin, colors of all the stones. In the attempt to determine the identity of the stones enumerated in Exodus XXVII and XXXIX, as adorning the breastplate of the high priest, we must bear in mind that this breastplate of Aaron and the one described by Josephus and brought to, by Titus to Rome after the capture of Jerusalem in 70 AD are in all probability the ex entirely distinct objects. The former, if it ever really existed, if it ever existed except in the ideal world of the authors of the priestly codex, must have been composed of the stone known to and used by the Egyptians of the 13th or 14th century BC, some of them being perhaps set in the jewels of gold and silver, jewels of silver, borrowed by the Israelis from the Egyptians just before the Exodus. On the other hand, the most trustworthy worthy indications regarding the stones of the breastplate of the Second Temple, made perhaps in the 5th century BC, should be sought in the early Greek and Latin versions of the Old Testament and in the treaties on the precious stones by Theophan Theophanrastus 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 precious stones by Theophanrastus who wrote about 4 about 300 BC the natural history of Pliny that great storehouse of ancient, ancient knowledge and the other early writers may also have used with profit, may be used with profit. I. Odom, the entomology of this word clearly indicates that we have to do with a red stone, most probably the carnelian. We know that in ancient Egypt, hieroglyphic texts from the Book of the Dead were engraved upon amulets made from this stone, and it was also used for early Babylonian cylinders. Fine specimens of carnelian were obtained from Arabia, the Greek Septuagint, and the Latin Vulgate, as well as Josephus in the War of the Jews, and Ephanius, all translate Sardius, the ancient designation of Carnelian, in his Antiques. However, Josephus renders Odom by Scaronyx, the Egyptian word Chenem, was used to designate red stones and seemed to have been applied indifferently to red jasper and red feldspar, as well as carnelian. Red, oh yeah, I have some red feldspar. Indeed, the first name material was more freely used in early Egyptian work than the carnelian. 
It is therefore probable that in Mosaic times, Odom signified red jasper, while for the 5th century BC, carnelian would be better rendering, would be the better rendering. This modern name of the sardius, signifying the flesh-colored stone, first appears in Latin translation of a treaty by Luca, Ben Costa, who wrote in the 10th century AD. The name of the Reuben is said to have been engraved on the Odom stone, which occupied the first place on the breastplate. Pit da, there seems to be little doubt that this, the topazius of ancient writers, which usually signifies our chrysolite or peridot, not our topaz for Pliny and his successors, described that topazius as a stone of a greenish hue. A legend related by Pliny gives it gives as the place of origin an island in the Red Sea called Topazios or Topazian to conjecture because it was difficult to find. However, the Hebrew Pitta appears to have been derived from the Sanskrit Pitta, yellow, and should therefore have originally signified a yellow stone, perhaps our topaz. W.N. Filders, Flinders, Petrie, probably influenced by this Sanskrit etymology, sees in it the yellow serpentine used in ancient Egypt. If nevertheless we admit that a light green stone occupied the second place on the mosaic breastplate, it was because it was perhaps the light green serpentine. This was called meh in the Egyptian and often used for amulets. In the case of the later breastplate, we may substitute the peridot. On this second stone was engraved the name Simeon, Bereketh. Here the Septuagint, Josephus, <laughs> Josephus, and the Vulgate agree in translating Smargadus. And we know that emerald mines were worked at Mount Zabadara, Zabara in, nu in Nubia before the beginning of our era, and that the emeralds was known and used in Egypt there does not seem to be any reason for rejecting the usual transla translation emerald. Still, it must be admitted that smaragdus often designates other green stones than the emerald. The suggestion has been made by Myers and Petri that the passage of Revelation 4, 3, where the rainbow is likened to smaragdus, indicates that the writer used this name for rock crystal. But this conjecture is scarcely satisfactory since it confuses the prismatic effect of light which has traversed the crystal with the crystal itself. There can be little doubt that a stone of brilliant coloration like the emerald, not a colorless one like rock crystal, would be used as a simile of the rainbow. Whether the mosaic breastplate already contained the emerald is another question, and it seems rather more likely that green feldspar freely used in ancient Egypt for amulets and known as ut was the third stone of the proto breastplate. The authorized version makes the carbuncle the third instead of the fourth stone upon the breaketh was engraved the name Levi. For Nofek, this name is rendered by the Septuagint and Josephus, and Carbuncle by the Vulgate. This designation, signifying literally a glowing coal, was used for certain stones distinguished by their peculiar, peculiarly re brilliant red color, such as the ruby and certain fine garnets. While it is quite possible that the oriental ruby may have been in the breastplate seen by Josephus, it is almost certain that it could not have been in the original breastplate of mosaic times, since there is absolutely no proof that this stone was known in ancient Egypt. Hence, we are inclined to believe that in the 13th century BC, the name Nofek designated the alum, alamandine garnet or some similar variety of that stone. The authorized version has emerald here instead of the third place. On this fourth stone of the breastplate was engraved the tribal name Judah. Number four, five, sapphire. 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 This is rendered sapphirious in the old versions. 
The stone cannot have been our sapphire, for both Theo, Theo, I've said these names and now I can't. Theophastus and Pliny described the sapphiris as a stone with golden spots, thus showing that they meant the lapis lazuli, which is often spotted with particles of pyrite having a golden sheen. This stone was named Chespet by the Egyptians and was highly prized by them. A quantity of lapis lazuli often appearing as an important item in the lists of tribute paid to Egypt among the gifts sent by Babylonia to the Egyptian monarchs and obtained from the oldest mines in the world. These were worked at a period of 4000 BC and are still and still are worked to this day. And from this material, amulets and figures were made, many of which have been preserved for us. And the Egyptian high priest is said to have worn, suspended from his neck, an image of Mac, the goddess of truth, made of lapis lazuli. The name is composed, the name is composed of the Latin lapis, a stone, and the lajuard, the name of the stone in Persia. From this later word is also derived our azure. In ancient times, the lapis lazuli was the blue stone par excellence because of its beautiful color and the valuable ultramarine dye derived from it. Although Pliny writes in some numbers, 39, that this stone was too soft for engraving, this fact needed not have, been pre need not have prevented its use in the breastplate since the stones set therein were not intended for use as seals and hence were not subject to any wear. In this connection, however, it is somewhat strange that the Hebrew word sapphire appears to indicate a stone especially adapted to receive inscriptions. The fact that the lapis lazuli was so greatly esteemed in ancient Egypt and was still much used as an ornamental stone in Greek and Roman times renders it probable that it was set not only in original breastplate, but also in that of a later age upon this fifth stone, the name Ishchar was inscribed. Yahalom, the sixth stone of the Septuagint version of the Joseph of Josephus is the I can't pronounce that. I don't even know what it says. It's too small. Probably green jasper or jade, and this has been assumed to show that in the original Hebrew text, Yeshpeha, Yesh, Yeshpe, was the sixth stone in place of Yahalom, the twelfth stone of the Greek version is the onyx and this seemed to have been most pro this seems to be the most probable equivalent of the hebrew yahom yahalom some hebrew sources however render it diamond and luther in his german version of the bible as well as our other authorized versions translate it thus this renders its base upon the de derivation of the word yahalom from the verb meaning to smite thus making the name of the stone signify the smiter. A designation not inappropriate for the diamond, which because of its extreme hardness has the power to cut or smite all other stones. However, for this purpose, the emery corundum or semiris point shammer mentioned in Zechariah was most likely used. The diamond was certainly not used in this way, in very early times, although it is possible that the stone was employed in engraving in the 5th century BC. These considerations induced us to prefer the traditional interpretation of the yellow home and translate it onyx. In this case, the smiter could be explained as detonating the use of the engraved onyx for sealing as engraving figures or letters were stuck upon some of the soft material to make impressions. Zebulun was a tribal name inscribed on the Yehom. Seven, Lashem. No stone in the breastplate is more difficult to determine than this one. The Septuagint Josephus and the Vulgate all translate Ligurius, an appellation sometimes applied to amber or substances quite unfit for use in the breastplate among other engraved stones. Probably the original significance of the Ligurius was amber, this name being used because Ligeria in northern Italy was the chief source or supply for Greece and the Orient. Amber, which had been gathered on the stone on the shores of the Baltic, being brought by traders to Ligeria and forwarded thence to other lands, 
as however the Greeks had another name for amber, electron. The name Ligurian appears to have been applied later to a variety of the jacknith, somewhat resembling amber in color, and then other varieties of the same stone. The original form of the name was, ev was evidently Ligurion, which was later changed to Lincurion, and was then explained as the meaning as meaning the urine of the lynx. This fanciful etymology gave rise to the story that the Ligurios, or rather the Lincurius, was the solidified urine of the lynx. The term Lincurion was used by Theophanrath, Theophanrastus, may possibly have included the sapphire as well as the jacknet since he lays a special stress upon the coldness of the substance, a quality characteristic of the sapphire, and also of the still denser jacknith. Hence, it appears that we have, even in the name Ligurius, some justification for the acceptance, the rendering Hyacinthius, suggested by the list of foundation stones in Revelation XXI 20 and already purposed in Epiphanius, Bishop Constantinia, about 400 AD, whether Hyacinthius should be rendered sapphire or jackness, and is not to determine, as this name seems to have been indifferently, indifferently for both stones with the Arabs under the form Yakut. It became a generic term for the varieties of the corundum gems. Boy, they put too many freaking horrible words in front of me, and it's it's torture. Listening to myself break and stutter with no cadence makes me want to stab my eyes out and stomp on my tongue. Uh. Whew. For the mosaic breastplate, we are forced to seek for some stones known in ancient Egypt where the sapphire does not seem to have been introduced to at an early date. If we could accept the suggestion from Bruch, Bruch that the Egyptian Neshem stone reputed to have a wonderful magic to have wonderful magic virtues was the same as the Hebrew Leshem, a brown agate would have been the seventh stone in the original breastplate, as Wendell gives very strong reasons for the rendering Neshem in this way. The colored designations were very freely used in Egyptian, and therefore reddish or yellow-brown agate may have been used. The Lashem bore the tribal name Joseph. 8. Shebo. This is unfortunate. This is a... <clears throat> I can't even start it properly. <laughs> this is uniformly rendered in the ancient versions and in Josephus by agate, a composite stone highly esteemed in the very ancient times and hence worthy of a place among the stones of the breastplate. At a later period, as Pliny notes, it became so common that it was but little regarded. Nevertheless, the fact that the various kinds of agates were believed to have many talismanic and therapeutic virtues, the great variety of coloration observable in these stones, and the curious figures and markings displayed by many of them, served to make them favorite objects. The entomology of the word Shibo suggests that it designated more specific, especially a banded agate, and that the set, and that set in the proto breastplate, was most probably one with gray and white bands, as this variety often appears in Egyptian work. There would have been no lack of contrast between these stones and the reddish or yellow brown agate of uniform color, which may have occupied the seventh plate. For the later breastplate may have chosen any one of many kinds of banded agates. This stone had engraved upon it the name Benjamin. One second, I forgot I let my cats out. Sheba, Felix, come on. Sheba, Felix. Uh, she was already up by the back window, I guarantee it. She would have been standing by the back window quietly meowing, and he's fucking gone somewhere. He'll be back in like an hour or something. But she will just hide and meow so quietly. She's such a little dainty girl with her smoky little kitty voice. And I don't see them anywhere, so we'll get back to reading.
my problem is, is I like to get up really early and then let them out before anybody's at work and then get them in right as people are going to work because they really like the water company that's behind me. But then those big trucks start moving and stuff and they'll bed down and they won't move until they, they feel safe. I might not see them for a while. Um, but, you know, after poker nights, I can't get out of bed at four o'clock and five o'clock because I'm there. I'm, I'm coming home at two o'clock in the morning, starving and eating some food and still up for another hour to wind down before I go to sleep because it's like an hour and a half ride home from the place. Which is, it feels like half a death sentence every time I'm doing it. <laughs> it's so much slower to ride on sidewalks and it's actually illegal to ride bicycles on sidewalks. But cars in Florida do not care. These idiots pull right up next to you and then honk their horn and rev their engines as hard as they could as if they're trying to chase you off the road. Alama, as in the stone, also, oh, this is nine, Alama, as in the stone, also, all the authorities are in agreement and render Alama by amethyst. This was not, however, the oriental amethyst, a variety of corundum, but a dark blue or purple variety of quartz. Both Arabia and Syria furnished a supply of amethyst. The Hebrew name shows that this stone was believed to possess the virtue of inducing dreams and visions. While as, in well known, while as is well known, the Greek name characterizes it, characterizes it as an enemy or preventive of inebriety. Or preventative of getting drunk. Inebriation. Inebriety. It should be inebriation. The amethyst was known in ancient Egypt and probably was named Hemag, Hemag. In the Book of the Dead, a heart made of Hemag is mentioned, and two such heart-shaped amulets of amethyst are preserved in the Balakor Museum. As the amethyst retains its repute as a stone of beauty and power throughout the Greek and German periods, we may safely assert that it was set in both first and second breastplates. Upon the Alema was engraved the name Dan. 10. Tarshish. The Septuagint, the Septuagint renders this word chrysolite, where it is used in the description of the breastplate, as does Joseph, Josephus also. And in the authorized version, barrel is the rendering. We have already stated that the topaz of the ancients was used our chrysolite or peridot, and the name chrysolite appears to have been used to designate our topaz. This is indeed indicated by the literal meanings of the word golden stone. The Tarshish received its name from the Tartesius in Spain, an important commercial station of the Phoenicians. The stone derived from this source was not, of course, our oriental topaz, a variety of corundum, nor was it the true topaz. Neither is it at all likely that the name Tarshish signified, at least originally, the genuine topaz. Most probably, it donated a variety of quartz, which occurred in Spain. This is originally black, but is decolorized by heating to a deep brown. And if the heating be prolonged, the stone becomes paler and eventually entirely transparent. The ancients were familiar with this, proper with this property. In ancient Egyptian records, in ancient Egyptian records, a stone called thethen is frequently mentioned as a material from which amulets were made. This Egyptian name signifies primarily a yellow stone and might designate either the topaz or the yellow jasper. Known and used in Egypt at a very early date, the topaz was probably not known there earlier than 5 or 600 BC. Hence, in spite of the unquestionable difficulty offered by the geographical name Tarshish, which might seem to confine us to a Spanish origin for the stone, the probabilities favor the selection of the yellow jasper as the tenth gem in Aaron's breastplate, for this made with pious zeal by those who labored to renew the glories of the old Jerusalem, we chose the topaz, probably indeed a fine specimen, the genuine topaz, for whatever quality of the yellow stone originally brought from the tar Tartessus, the name may well have been applied to the genuine topaz when that stone became known to the Jews, either in Babylonia or after their return to Palestine. The Tarshish was engraved with the name 
Neftali. Eleven, Shosham. The Septuagint translates barrel, but in our authorized version, and in that used by Roman Catholics, the so-called Dawi version, the word is invariably rendered onyx. Diodorus, Siculus, Dionysus, Paragetes, writing in the first century BC, are the first classical authors who use the name barrel. While this name does not appear in the treaties of Theophan, Theophanrastus, Theophanrastus, he evidently includes the barrel among his smaragati. In, indeed, the true emerald is simply a variety of the barrel and owes its beautiful coloration to a slight admixture of chromium. The finest barrels were brought from India. Besides the specimen set in the breastplate, the high priest wore on his shoulders two Shosham stones, each engraved with the names of six of the tribes. After carefully weighing the evidence, we believe that the stones worn by the high priest of the second temple were Akamarines. In an endeavor to determine the Shosharam stones used in the Mosaic times, we have no very definite information to guide us. On the whole, the conjecture of J.L. Myers that they were Malachites seems to have much in its favor, for this material was known to the ancient Egyptians and appears to have been often used for amulets. The Egyptian name for Malachite, as well as for other green stones, was Mephek, and a ring of Mephek is mentioned in an Egyptian text. Undoubtedly, at a later period in Egyptian history, Mephek may also have, deno have deno denoted barrel. Easy word. In view of the fact that the turquoise was unquestionably known to the Egyptians at a very early date, the supply being derived from mines in, Sinui, in the Sinui Peninsula, which were rediscovered by MacDonald, we might be tempted to suggest that the Shosham stones were turquoise. The light blue or blue-green of the specimens of this stone found in Mount Sinai would make an even better contrast to the neighboring jade than would the bright green malachite. On the Shoham of the breastplate, the name God was engraved. I'm sorry, the name Gad was engraved. 12. Yasepheth. If, as appears almost certain, this name originally occupied the sixth place in the original Hebrew text, all the ancient versions agree in translating it Jasper as a Sir an Assyrian form of the name Yeshapu as in shown by the Tel, Aram, Tel El Amarana letters in the cuneiform writing dating from not long before the Exodus. Exodus. Yeah, there we go. I, I thought there was a paragraph i didn't stop at a paragraph oh i'm so dumb okay give me a second guys sorry i keep i keep looking because it's been a while i just saw the word exodus scanning and then i lost it well uh, maybe i'll just have to Writing in 220. Green Jasper is often written to write according to Galenus, so recommend you as Egyptian writers on medicine. Abel, yeah, I'm just going to start. Abel, Remusat, the great French Orientalist, writing in 1820, was on one of the first to see the Yesfet of the, the Yashfet of the Hebrews and in the Green Jasper of the Greeks and Romans. The material jade, nephrite or jadeite, the Chinese yu stone, these minerals were both in the old and new world and were everywhere believed to possess wonderful virtues. Very likely, the powers supposed to characterize jade were later attributed to green jasper. But there is every reason to suppose that the true jade was always more highly prized than its jasper substitute, for it was much rarer and was e easily distinguishable by its translucency. For Jasper was a similar color until quite recently, only Turkestan 
Burma, and New Zealand have supplied jade, and most of that used in other lands came from prehistoric relics or from sources unknown to us. It seems highly probable that the Yeshfe, which adorned the breastplate made for Aaron, was a piece of nephrite or jadeite, possibly in the later breastplate green jasper, may have been employed. This stone was inscribed with the tribal name Asher. In the following lists of the precious and semi-precious stones contained in the earlier and later breastplates, the writer does not claim to have finally solved the problem presented by the Hebrew accounts of the high priest's adornment, but he hopes that the, dis that the distinction established here between mosaic breastplate and that of the second temple, separated from each other by the, interver by the interval of eight centuries, may serve to clear up some of the difficulties encountered in the treatment of this subject. And there's a list right here. The following list, oh, I guess if there's anybody that's actually listening at this in some later date that's like seeing challenge, I do need to read it. I talked about this earlier. The breastplate of Aaron is the first list. The breastplate of the second temple is the second list. The first list is every, the list is the stone that, that we just talked about. So the breastplate of Aaron, red jasper, breastplate of the second temple, carnelian, light green serpentine for Aaron, peridot for the other, green feldspar, emerald, alamand, alam, alamandine garnet, ruby, lapis lazuli, lapis lazuli, onyx, onyx, brown agate, sapphire, or jackknife. Banded agate, banded agate, amethyst, amethyst, yellow jasper, topaz, malachite, barrel, green jasper or jade, green jasper or jade. The following list shows the variations of the different ancient authorities in regards to the names of the gems in the breastplate. <laughs> I don't even ever want to read this. Hebrew, Odom. Yeah, you know, I, I hate, I, I, I'm sorry, but I'm just, I, it's the same word mostly over and over again, and I'm just not into reading this list because it's, I always end up screwing something up. List number one, Odom, and then it says the names in the different, different centuries. Odom, Sardion, Sardonyx, Sardius, 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 or Ruby. Number two, Pida. Topazian, Topazos, Topazius, Topaz. Number three, Bereketh, Smaragodon, Smaragados, Smaragados, and then all the way down to Carbuncle. Nofak, Anthrax. Oh, I'm supposed to be reading the dates. So the first one is Hebrew. The second one is about 25 BC. The third one is about 90 AD. The fourth name is about 400 AD. Fifth name is 1611 AD, and then the revised version is 1884 AD. And I, I'm sorry to whoever ends up, if they're just listening to this and you can't see, I'm skipping over the list because the way I'm going to read it is not going, it's, I'm skipping over the list. Come on, baby. Where you at? Come on, I see you. Yeah, that's a good girl. Come on. Hi. That's a good girl. Let's yell for Felix again. Felix! Let's go! Well, one of them's back. <clears throat> the sneakier of the two is back. The high priest's breastplate, as described in Hebrew tradition, was regarded by the Jews with peculiar reverence, and the stones said in it were believed to be emblematic of many things. It is therefore quite natural that these stones are described in the book of Revelation as the foundation stones of the New Jerusalem. The names are not in some cases, the names are in some cases not identical with those given in Exodus. But this may arise from various renderings of the Hebrew names in the Targums or in the Greek versions. The text in Revelation is as follows. And there came unto one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven plagues and talked with me saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. 
He carried me away in the spirit to the great high mountain, showing me that the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And he carried me away in spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out from heaven from God. Having the glory of God and her light was like unto the stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clearly as crystal. And had a great... I lost place again. Crystal. And had a great and high and had 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and names written thereon which are the names of the 12 she's making me lose my space all right you're, you're, you're not helping me right now and had a great wall and a great I'm starting over, not at the top. And had a great, and had a wall, great and high, and had 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. At the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them, the names of the 12 apostles of the land. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square and the length is large as the breadth. He measured the city with the reed 12,000 furloughs, furlongs. The length and the breast and the height of it are equal. He measured the wall thereof and 140, 500, 140 and four cubits according to the measure of the man, that is, of the angel, and the building of the wall, it was of jasper, and the city was of pure gold, like unto clear glass. All the foundations of the wall in the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eleventh a jackknife, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. <laughs> Every several gate was one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. You don't like that voice? Is that what it is? Do you think I'm upset? Huh? Do you think I'm upset? Huh? Is that what it is? I don't think she likes me doing that voice. <clears throat> it is easy to trace in this description. I don't like that voice either. The substitution of the 12 apostles for the 12 tribes in connection with the precious stones enumerated. And besides this, we, have also ha we also have the 12 angels associated with a later date with the months and signs of the zodiac. Of the 12 foundation stones, the revelation of St. John expressly states that had in them the names of the 12 apostles of the land. The assignment of each stone to the respective apostle was made in later times according to the order given in the list of the apostles contained in the so-called synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These lists are not quite identical. Andrew, for instance, being placed second in Matthew and Luke, but fourth in Mark, and the same stone was not always assigned to the given apostle. Frequently, the list was modified by the addition of the apostle Paul, really the 13th apostle. In this case, he was usually given the second place immediately after St. Peter, and to the brothers James and John, the sons of thunder, was assigned a single stone. In some later arrangements, St. Paul occupies the last place after St. Matthias, who was chosen to take place of Judah, is Cariot, and whose name as an apostle first appears in the Acts. List of the Apostles. The first list is the Gospel of St. Matthew 2 through 4. The second name on the list in each row is the Gospel of St. Mark 16 through 19. 
the third list in each, the third name in each row of these lists is the Gospel of St. Luke via 14 through 16. Peter, 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 Andrew, James, Andrew, James, John, James, John, Andrew, John, Philip, 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 Bartholomew, 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 Thomas, Matthew, 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 Thomas, Thomas, James the Less, James the Less, James the Less, Thaddeus, Thaddeus, Simon Zelots, Simon Zelots, Simon Zelots, Judah, Judah Issachrot, Judah Issachrot, Judah Issachrot. Once again, the first name in each row was the Gospel of Matthew 2 through 4. The second name in each row was the Gospel of Mark 16 through 19. And the third name in each row was the Gospel of Luke 14 through 16. So that's how I should do this. The passage of this Revelation 21, 19, 20, is not the only one in the book treating of precious stones. For we read in chapter 4, 2, 3, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he sat, was to look upon a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the, the throne in sight, like unto an emerald. The commentators, both ancient and modern, have given many different explanations of the symbolic meaning of similes employed here. Some have seen in the two stones a type of two judgments of the world by fire and by water. Others find that they signify the holiness of God and his justice, of rainbow like unto an emerald. Alfred says we should not think it strange that the bow is green instead of prismatic. The form is that of the convex bow, the color even more refreshing and more directly symbolizing grace and mercy. The significance of the 12 apostolic gems is given by Rabinus Marius, Archbishop of Mainz, 786 through 856 in the following words. And I'm just going to read it in my voice because my voices have not been going so hot today. In the jasper is figured the truth of faith. In the sapphire, the height of celestial hope. In the chalcedony, the flame of inner charity. In the emerald is expressed the strength of faith, faith in adversary. In the sardonyx, the humility of the saints in spite of their virtues. In the sard, the venerable blood of the martyrs. In the chrysolite, indeed, is shown true spiritual preaching accompanied by mirac miracles. In the barrel, the perfect operation of prophecy. In the topaz, the ardent contemplation of prophecy. Lastly, in the chrysoprase is demonstrated the work of blessed martyrs and their reward in the, lap, in the high synth. The celestial rapture of the learned in their high thoughts and their humble descent to human things out of regard for the weak. In the amethyst, the constant thought of the heavenly kingdom of humble souls. The origin, uh-oh, I just bumped something and I think my camera stopped working. No, camera's still working. I definitely bumped it there. It totally reset itself because uh, the screen is way different than it was. But, you know, whatever. It's on. That's good enough. It went too wide. It, was, it used to be narrower. Now you can see way more than you could see when I first started. But, hey, four people, how you doing? Yes, Scott Lambert. Lambright, he is in the Virgin Valley. All right. Back to the story at hand. The origin of the foundation stone named in Revelations. Oh, I already did. No, I didn't. 19 through 20 may be found in the text as Isaiah, live, live, 11 and 12, where we read, O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors and lay thy foundation with sapphires. And I will make thy wisdom of agates and thy gates of carbuncle and all thy borders of pleasant stones. One second, please. Come on, Bubba. I heard you tapping. Yeah, well, you know, you've been out there forever. Don't cry to me like you were lost. You're warm. You were sleeping in the sun, you liar. 
Yeah, I know. You came back. You get treats. Here. You're welcome. All right. Everybody's home. Everybody's home. <clears throat> As we see, only three stones are mentioned by name. The sapphire, the carbuncle, and agates. This last rendering is quite doubtful as the Hebrew word kohidim signifies shining or gleaming stones and their use for windows indicate that they must have been transparent. It is easy to understand that in later times, the 12 stones of the breastplate dedicated to the 12 tribes of Israel were used to fill out the com to fill out complete and complete the picture. Following the indication given by the general term, stones with fair colors and pleasant stones. In commentating on this, Rabbi Jonan is quoted in the Babylonian Talmud as saying that God would bring jewels and pearls 30 L's square, 20 L's in height, and 10 in width, and would place them on the gates of Jerusalem. There may be in this some reminiscence of the apocalyptic foundation stones. A sceptical discipline said to the rabbi, we do not ever find a jewel as large as the egg of a dove. But not, long, but not long afterwards, when this same disciple was sailing in a boat on the sea, he saw angels sawing stones as immense of those described by Rabbi jo 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 Yohanan. It's Yohanan, isn't it? And when he asked for what they were designed... <clears throat> But not long afterwards, when this same dis disciple was sailing in a boat on the sea, he saw angels sawing stones as immense as those described by Rabbi Yohanan. And when he asked for what they were designed, the reply was, The Holy One, blessed be, he will place them on the gates of Jerusalem. Whew. Well, I tell you what. I've had a hard go of reading this morning for some reason. Um, and then on top of that, all of my leaning forward in order to be at the screen and then at poker tables, leaning forward, boy, it is killing my back right in the in-between spot, like that spot you can't quite reach with your arms. The muscles are just absolutely killing me, and I know why. I have got to put my body under physical stress to build muscle. Like my back, back muscles are just not what they should be. And uh, all of the leaning forward for hours and hours playing poker and then reading, which has been more consistently in a row playing poker. But, you know, I mean, if you're making like $200 an hour, what else are you going to do? You know what I'm saying? Fucking nothing. Um, so... On that note, Davey is going to start taking his butt to get fit again. Coleco got to get strong. Uh, we're going to end the the reading here, and I think it's a good spot because births. I, I think we've only been going for like an hour this morning. I'm just feeling it worse than normal um, because it has been a lot of leaning forward in a chair the last three days, especially. You know, I mean, eleven hour session one day, and then like a six hour session the next day but I do a lot of bad posture in all of that. Anyways, let me uh, minimize this screen and go to the screen where I can see you guys, and we'll chat for a second. Hey, yo, it's me. Anyways. Septuagint. Septuagint. Yep, that would help when I'm reading. Let's go back through the chat. Hey, everybody's been chatting a little bit. Really appreciate that, guys. The more that you chat, the more the algorithm thinks that, you know, I'm doing good. If I had like a thousand people here and nobody said anything, the algorithm would probably think that my videos really, really suck. Thank you, Archangel for Truth, for always coming in and asking people to hit the like button because I don't tell the end if they're even there. 
And Coleco shall go prospecting hither to many lands. He shall go video recording his prospecting for many days. And he shall upload the video to YouTube where he shall watch them and like them. That's funny, Archangel. I like that. <laughs> Mohammedunians. <laughs> but I'm headed out into the smoke. Is there a fire going on there, Resort Dog? Yeah, you you probably could, Margaret, but I think that it, it Margaret says you you act, you could just substitute Muslim for Mohammedan. Mohammedan or Mohammed, it is Mohammedan. It's Mohammedan, it's not Mohammedan. I'm pronouncing everything wrong. Um, she's right, I could substitute it but I think part of it is trying to stay as close to the original as possible. I mean, they start saying stupid, you know, too racist of a word consistently, and, and I'll avoid that. But he says it's too hot to even claw through cement hard clay for opals. Yeah, everybody's dying in the heat right now. Like, there are literally people. <laughs> They're talking about Valley Girl stuff. I'm just I'm just going through the chat, guys. Don Dietrich shot down and washed up on a beach and was told all the gems he picked up belonged to the Raja. They became good friends, brought him silver adverantine on his jet to Oregon. Adver adverantine. I'm glad you were still waking up, Scott. Uh, this was extremely late for me. Uh, tomorrow will definitely be earlier. I can't wait to go get my second cup of coffee. Getting to the going to the Sunstone Mine and collecting area in three weeks. Super stoked! That's awesome, Scott. Um, if you collect a whole bunch of clears, uh, I can use them. I have use for clear sunstones. Uh, actually, not right now, but I will later. Anyways, so we got five people hanging out here. Hey, five people. We actually got to the hour and a half mark, which that's, you know, that's pretty good. I'm shooting for an hour and a half to two hours, depending on how long the chapters are and where they're going to lead us and how everything's going and stuff like that. So uh, I have got a lot of running to do today. My day is going to be completely filled. My laundry is completely a mess, but I have got to go and pay bills. I've got to go and deposit the money. And I've got to go get some gold out of Hawk. I got some gold at a pawn shop that I knew I was going to get the money back to get out. And I'm, I'm there earlier. My, my thing is I still have two weeks before I have to make the payment or pull the stuff out. The question is, do I magnify the money or I just go get the stuff out so I can place it for sale, which was the orig original request from the people. Which, I mean, I... If I get the stuff out, I have to go and get it appraised. That's really what I have to. I don't even really have to sell it. I could sit on it and just ask them if they want it back. Um, I don't know. I'm such a I don't know bot today. I'm like a fucking can't make a decision. I, all my decisions yesterday were fantastic. Make good decisions. Knowing when somebody I was like looking at him, I could just tell his bet was bullshit and call his $100 bet on the river. And sure enough, he'd have nothing. Ace high was good enough. I had a really good day yesterday. Um, I'm feeling very content at a poker table and like I know exactly what's going on. And every time I feel like that on the inside, I make money. And anytime I feel like I don't know what's going on, I lose money. <laughs> so, <laughs> but over the last month, it has been a extreme climb in in over the last two months it, it, when I'm there. I have had very little loser losing days, but I cap my losings at 400 max and I'd never cap my winnings. So if I keep having two to one, we'd be doing really good on the road, making lots of fun. Um, also, we have the $35 grab bags coming up. If you didn't see that video, go and check it out. It got a pretty fair amount of views. There's a lot of really good stuff in there. Um, very few people are going to be disappointed with what they get. And before I do the grab bags, I'm also going to contact Metal Feather, my friends today, 
and uh, I'm going to talk to them about the possibility of if you purchase a grab bag instead of the grab bag going to you directly, the grab bag being opened up here because you want to purchase something it made into. Because my friends at Metal Feather, she's very good at what she does and she's very quick at what she does. She could do a ring around a stone or a pendant for a stone, I think, and I don't think it would take her too long. Um, I think that you could pick, I wouldn't put anything in copper, silver or gold wire that she would wrap it in. And I think that it could be expedited rather quickly. And I don't think, I, I think they would appreciate the business right now too. So I think it, it, it's a, it's a, we scratch their back, they scratch ours type of thing, right? If you buy a grab bag, do you just want a rare stone? Or would you just want the stone? Or would you like a stone to be put in something you could wear when it shows up in a week or two if if Metal Feather's into it? So uh, I'm going to contact them today and have a conversation uh, with that about them. I'm also going to invite them on the podcast. Uh, I really like him and his wife, and uh, they're very nice people trying to make a living with their art. And you know how I appreciate that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not very good at making money with my art. And as a team, they're doing a good job of making money with their art and, and surviving. And they're running their own rat race instead of rat racing for somebody else. And it just feels so much better when you are running your own rat race instead of rat racing for somebody else. So much so that just barely making it yet working on the dream is so fulfilling compared to making really good money for the job you're doing, but being treated like shit or being looked down upon is as unfulfilling. It really, really is. So work on the dream if you can. I love you for being here. I'll see you tomorrow morning earlier than today. And uh, just keep listening to what I, like, what I have to say, man. Like, share, subscribe, and all that jazz. I love you for watching. And I'll see you soon. Bye, guys. Thank you.